Hi everyone, how you doing? <laughs> it's a little traumatic. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm Deborah Birnbaum, I'm Variety's Executive Editor of TV, and it's my pleasure to welcome the star of the evening, Jessica Biel. Thanks, grossed out, huh? Grossed out. <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. So what did you guys think? Good? Like? <laughs> Just curious, have, other, have you seen the whole series? Because we're going to get into spoilers here, people. All right, good. <laughs> are, we, are we spoiler alerting all night we're tonight? We're spoiler okay. alerting all night. Just, just warning you. All right, why don't you start at the beginning? What made you want to take on this project? I know you were involved in the development of it as well. Yeah, so uh, my amazing partners at UCP brought my producing partner, Michelle, and I this book, and I read the book. And the second I started to get involved in this book, it just kept taking twists and turns that I couldn't anticipate. And I was continually shocked and grossed out, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> um, and it just, it was so clear, you know, that it, this was such a... Um, just a compelling, compelling character, a, a very uh, unreliable na narrator, you know, who at times can't even, she can't even trust her own memory, which is really unique, I think, in terms of a, a creative uh, endeavor. So that's kind of how it started. I read the book, loved the book, thought this is gonna be a massive challenge. You know, can I do this? Can we, can we do this properly? And we just started down the path with them and we were a part of everything from um, meeting writers and creators, hiring Derek Simons, who turned out to be our amazing creator, writer, kind of the genius and the genius behind this whole thing and how he weaved everything together so beautifully. Um, and then casting and working with the writers and you know all the other steps that it takes to get something on the air. We just I, we had a hand in everything, which was an incredible, incredible experience. At what point did you decide you were gonna play Corey yourself? Yeah, page one of that book. <laughs> I was like, this is mine. <laughs> Nobody can have this. <laughs> you know, man, you gotta just snatch the good ones when you find them because as you guys know, the material is that, that's out there and available is just not great for the most part. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but a lot of things that I read and I occasionally may get an offer for, which is pretty rare, suck. <laughs> They're not, it's not good. Like you have to fight tooth and nail to find this incredible material. And when you find it, you got to grip it and then you have to produce it and you have to get in there and you have to do it because if you don't do it then somebody is going to not do it the way you would do it <laughs> was it always set up to be a tv show or did you ever contemplate it as a movie or you knew going in you wanted to make it a limited series i think actually Kate and Don are partners at ucp they brought it to us with that sort of in our minds already that this would be a limited series. Um, so I don't think we ever really thought about it as a, as a film. I think it's so complex and so complicated and it, there's, you need a lot of hours to sort of, you know, navigate the past and the present, how they kind of intermingle, when they do that, when they don't do that. So I think it would have been hard to see it as a film. You would have felt that there were a lot of holes, you know? How did you even begin to get into Cora's mindset? How did you prepare to play this role? That's a good question. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't do that when looking back, I thought, I'm such a moron. Why didn't I like talk to psychologists and talk <laughs> to people who have dissociative disorders and PTSD and all this stuff? I, I read a lot about that. And then honestly, um, this is gonna sound maybe a little bizarre, but Derek, our writer, creator, is also a teacher, an acting teacher, and takes, uh, takes part in lots of different workshops uh, doing dream work. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that kind of, that kind of technique. It's, it's kind of complicated, but it's sort of like talking to your subconscious and using dreams to sort of activate different parts of your life that you're still sort of you know working through and kind of um, infusing that into the role. So I kind of was messing around with a little bit of that, which is unusual for me. I don't really 
really work in that way, but this kind of thing, which was so heady and so complex emotionally, was, was it was helpful and it worked really well. And more than anything, I, I found a lot of empathy for this woman. I think maybe because I have a young son and the idea of never seeing him again without you know, being in a visitation situation was so incredibly emotionally moving for me, like genuinely on a human, beings, uh, like human being level, that I just was very emotional all the time while we were shooting this thing. I just, I, it was pouring out of me. I don't know if that was a lot of re, you know, repressed emotions for many years, or I don't know where it really came from, but... Um, I was really attached to this material for whatever reason. She's such a complicated character. She's such an unreliable narrator. Did, so obviously you knew where the story was going to go, but how do you like, you know, how do you play those scenes when you're lying to yourself, you're lying to the person you're talking to? How do you approach that as an actor? Um, that's another good question. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um, I, well, it was a it was sort of a dance that that we did with the whoever the director was, uh, whatever episode we were doing, and Derek, and myself. It was always this like navigation of, okay do I know what's going on or am I making it up? Okay, no, I'm making it up this time, but n but in the next scene, wait, I've totally forgotten. Like we were, we would do this crazy um, dance with each other because it was really hard to keep it in line and to know every moment what was happening because we were shooting, we were boarding episodes, so we were shooting two things at once, out of sequence, of course, and it was hard to keep track, but I guess, I, I guess more than anything, I I was just in terms of process uh, attacking those scenes, just to find the real truth of what I was experiencing that moment, that day, what I was feeling like, not trying to force anything, and just genuinely believe and listen to what I'm saying, because if if I was listening literally listening to what say maybe Bill Bill Pullman was t saying his lines or whatever I would just be affected somehow because I I was just able to to have a very raw experience I think because he was a very safe scene partner and we kind of created a really safe environment which we all know is super duper important for our work um, but honestly some of it was a bit of a blackout you know, like at the end of the day, I would kind of think, like, what, what the hell happened today? I don't even know what that scene's going to turn out to be <laughs> like. You brought up Bill Pullman. Her relationship with him is so crucial to this. How did you first build your chemistry with him? Well, he's easy to build chemistry with because he is, I don't quite know how to describe him. He's like this jovial, um, like, kind of. Uh, kind of weird, weird guy who's into nature, he's into like birds, and he's kind of this character who's like knows a lot about horticulture and knows about plants and knows about animals, and he's like one of those guys, it's like, oh my God, you have to look at this migrational system, it's in, oh my God, look, and I'm like, wow, you know, no idea what he's talking about, but he's so genuinely interested and wants to share with you, he's that kind of person, so he'd so up, show up on set in the morning, happy, cool, ready to go, you know, sweet, loving, he was just easy, he was easy to be around, and there wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of, like, neuroses or anything that, that, that I had to deal with, so... I, I love well, him. He's very lovable. <laughs> but he's not the same exact person as his character. Just <laughs> no, no, no. Just, just like the weird nature stuff. He's not, not the other well, weird the stuff. Other, well, like I don't know about stuff. that, actually. No, 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 Maybe. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Just like birds, my, bird migrations and things like that. <laughs> How involved were you in picking the rest of the cast, uh, given that your role as producer? Very involved. I mean, we watched a million tapes. We... I auditioned with a handful of different people. Um, we were, v m I say, I'm keeping, I, I'm saying we because I keep referring to my partner, Michelle, but we, um, we were involved at every step of the way. That was a very interesting process because I know so inherently how, how hard it is. And we all know 
what it's like to send a video in, you know, that you've done yourself and you're trying to figure out the lighting and, you know, sometimes, you know, does anyone even watch it? Who knows? I watched every single tape to the end because I understand the, co I mean, come on. And I, you would do it too because you know what, what everybody puts into that. It's so much work and so much of your time and it's hard and, I mean, some of the casting, like, Jacob Pitts, who plays a character, for, for anyone who hasn't seen the whole show, he plays a character kind of that comes in, I don't know, episode, gosh, I can't even remember, but someone that really has a lot to do with uh, Cora's past, and um, nobody watched his tape until, they didn't watch it all the way through to the final scene that he did, and we had had people doing about four, four scenes, and he was wearing glasses the whole time. And he was kind of supposed to be auditioning for this sort of tougher, like, drug drug dealer-y kind of a guy. He, this kind of changed along the way, but it was kind of a tougher guy. And he looked quite gentle, I guess, with his kind of small spectacles. I watched the final scene. I got through his whole tape, and he did this scene for whatever reason without glasses. And I was like, you, yo, you guys have to see this. La Did anybody watch that? La no, like, I, didn't, I didn't see that scene. I didn't, I didn't watch it all the way through because of the glasses. I was like, what? You have to see it. <laughs> and he got the part. Wow. So, you know, you have to watch the whole tape. <laughs> Maybe they'll take their glasses off, you know? <laughs> Helpful tip. <laughs> take your glasses off. Well, if you're playing like a tough guy, maybe. I don't know. I mean, don't, you, gotta, you don't want to play into type, but sometimes, you know, take your glasses off. <laughs> How did you balance your roles as executive producer and star of the show? How did you strike that right balance? I, I don't know if I ever really struck a good balance. It was really hard. Um, luckily, the team I had around me would take over when I was actually working on set, which was a lot of the time. And I did a lot of the producerial stuff kind of up until the actual filming and then sort of handed it over, which, thank goodness, I wasn't really wearing two hats when I was when I was actually working um, on film or on, on camera whatever um, but it it was it was really fun to on like on my days off which were few I would come in and I would sit next to the director and I would work with the actors or you know whisper things into the director try different things in terms of performance watching the scenes it was really a cool experience incredibly exhausting I don't believe I did find the the best balance, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. You know, it was, I knew it, there was going to be like four months of my life, which was going to be insane. And then it would be over and it, and, and it was over and it was okay. And I, I survived it. Would you want to produce another project again? Yeah, definitely. I would definitely want to do that. Um, I just think that having your hand uh, in the development process from the very beginning is so empowering and so rewarding. For me it was. I think also because as an actor, you know, you just don't get brought into the process as much as, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I want to understand and want to know, and wanna, well, why is the schedule chasing, changing? Just explain to me, I can understand. Oh, that, that's why? Fine, great, I get it. You know, but if you don't have a clue what's going on, I don't know, if sometimes it feels a little bit disrespectful. You feel like, why doesn't anybody care about what I have to say or feel about it? So I felt this great power in not a weird, you know, like narcissistic controlling way, but just like a, in a strong way where I felt that I was being heard and my opinion mattered. And um, I think, I think, I think actors get sort of the short end of the stick sometimes because we know we know these characters so well, even better than the writers, even better than the director, and sometimes you just don't really get that respect. And you you do a little bit more when you have your hand in, you know, the behind the scenes, the side of the, the you know, everything. What about directing? Is that something you would want to take on? I don't know. I've maybe I did. I directed this little, well, this short film for the, the Glamour Shorts, which I don't think was very good. But I wrote this little thing, and it was fun. I really enjoyed myself. <laughs> it was kind of different and interesting. I think I could be interested in that, but I, I would really have to understand the material, and maybe that means I would have to write something. But I also don't know how to do that and have a two-year-old. I. 
I, I honestly think that's why we don't have that many female directors who are in that age, you know, of, you know, you're either like 22 <laughs> or you're like 50, you know? I could maybe see myself doing that a lot older, maybe. Was there one scene in particular that was tough for you to film as an actor? There were a lot of tough scenes. Um, the interrogation sequences were really exhausting and, um, you know, trying to keep the level of emotion and intensity going after the master, after the close-up, after the over, after the other, oh, then there's the random footage cam that no one told you about that you have to do it again. You're like, what? <laughs> Just fake it. <laughs> you know, that, those were hard. There's, um, there was a lot, there's a lot of really intimate stuff that, you know, I hadn't really done that really like that in a long, long time, or maybe even ever, like I can't remember. I just haven't had like tons of like sex scenes before my career. And though the ones we did in the show were kind of assaulting. So that those were a struggle too. Did you have a favorite scene? That's a good question. Um, favorite scene to shoot or favorite scene to watch Let's later? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, because they're very different answers, probably. Start with shooting. What was your favorite scene to shoot? Um, that is such a hard question because they were all so brutal. They were so hard. There wasn't just one kind of nice sequence at all. <laughs> but, you know, I liked shooting all the past stuff which we haven't, you haven't seen in this pilot, you know? When my character's 23 or whatever in the past, there's a lot of fun stuff with my sister character and that kind of, those moments I really enjoyed. Um, shooting the water, the swimming stuff was super challenging. I was really sick, of course, you know, as you get, as you do in like some of the most important days of shooting. But I thought it, it came out beautiful. I liked, I liked watching it afterwards. But the, the, the in the, the, in the moment was just a total shit show. <laughs> so I guess you answered the question about what you like to watch. You like to watch the swimming scenes? I, yeah, I, that I thought just came out beautiful. It just looked nice um, and was compelling and interesting um, and, you know, very kind of metaphoric for what we were trying to say about what you're about to fall into, what you're about to experience. It goes to some pretty dark places. How do you get yourself into that mindset and then shake it off at the end of the day and go home to your two-year-old? Well, it does sound like it would be really hard to shake it off, but I'm I'm not one of those people that has an issue with that. I kind of bounce in and out, like takes over. What are we having for lunch? Let's eat. Okay, back in. Like I can kind of dip in and out pretty easily. And honestly, it was such a relief to go home <laughs> because the biggest decisions that I was making in my you know pea-sized brain is: Are we having animal crackers? Are we doing <laughs> peanut butter? Is it going? Are we going to the park? Like that was it. It wasn't like, oh, am I going to jail forever? What's happening? You know? <laughs> it was like very easy to just, oh, very relaxing. If you could go back to the first day of production, is there a piece of advice you would want to offer yourself? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the first day of production of, you know, maybe, Maybe looking back, you know, Monday night quarterbacking this thing, I would probably say don't be so hard on myself and, and just trust that, you know, you've put the work in and you know what you're doing and you will be successful in terms of performance. Not in, who knows about anything else, you know, who would have known. But it's just so easy, in my experience, in my opinion, in my career, to just, you know, just beat yourself up about everything, every moment. Oh, I didn't do that. I didn't, man, I didn't cry in that moment. I didn't do what I thought I was gonna do. And it just, it's just not worth the, the pain that you go through just to you know, be a little kinder and trust that you know what you're doing. The, sh the show was obviously a big ratings hit. Were you surprised by that? Why do you think people responded to it so much? I was very surprised. 
we had kind of gotten this big um, talking to from the network, like this is what's gonna happen, it's gonna have good ratings maybe the first episode and then it's gonna go way down on the second, so be prepared for that. <laughs> so we were kind of like, okay, okay, this is just gonna, just gonna be really weird and hard, it's gonna go way down, and then it went up, and then it went up, and it went up, and it would keep going up. It was just this weird, every week we were kind of waiting for the ball to drop and for everybody to just go, oh, this is a piece of crap, forget it, and no one watch it all. <laughs> And it never happened. Um, why did people really connect with this material? I think, I think maybe because twofold, it's an interesting look at sort of a possible kind of procedural kind of thing, you know. On, but it, it's kind of turned on its head a little bit with the whole why instead of who. I think that was an interesting structure, which piqued people's interests. Also, you know, sort of thematically, what we're talking about just one of the things that we're talking about in the show is you know culturally how we are not really comfortable talking about f trauma that we've experienced in our lives or 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 flaws and who we are as people and honestly how close we all are to having a moment where we do just snap and make the the other decision you know um, that sort of fine line, that balance of all human beings being, you know, sinners and saints and good and evil and like all these things, like this is just within us as humans, I think. And we're kind of bringing this to light and like really having to look at it and look at flaws and talk about, you know, that trauma just continues to beget more trauma. So how do you stop it? And you know, it's kind of interesting material. Maybe subconsciously, it feels good to put it out there, you know, to kind of put it out in the open and somehow discuss it, and discuss it through a character that, you know, isn't, is, doesn't really exist in the real world. You mentioned at the beginning that it's so rare to find a rich character like this. Why do you think it's so rare, and what can we do to combat that? Another good question. Um, well, I think number one, there's just not enough stories f uh, about or for women, women's experiences, and like really, you know, in intriguing, complicated uh, storytelling with women at the front of it. Not to say that you know we don't want to see those stories where men are that you know in the forefront because we do and we love that. I love that too. But there, there's just not enough for women ever there has never been in my experience in this business and even now it's just such a short supply of really beautiful moving material funny or drama or whatever um how do we combat that i don't know more female writers more female directors more female producers more more not even that also just just people who are unafraid to to say this is an interesting story and we should talk, we should tell it and we should, we should put it out there whether people watch it or not. I think a lot of the, the business feels right now like fueled by this fear that, well, I may not get good ratings, so then I may not get a return on my money, which I get because, you know, <laughs> this is a business and people need to make money, but it's also finding that fine line again between the business and the creative side because that's what we do. We just, you know, we're, we're creative half the half the community of this business are the creative people sitting in this room who you know it doesn't matter about the dollar you 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 would do anything to to be a part of that incredible project that one person sees i don't know it's a it's a tough battle i'm not quite sure how to fix it do you think that there, now that there's so many different platforms for tv there's so many different outlets we're seeing more of that on tv than we are in film are you more interested in TV or film, or is it you just go where the roles are? I definitely go where the roles are, but the roles seem to be on TV. They really do. Because what you're saying, the platforms are endless. It, and there's no, there's no stigma anymore, which is so amazing. I mean, did you ever, could you ever imagine this particular show being on USA of all networks? <laughs> I mean, it blew me away. I couldn't believe they bought the show. I was like, you guys made a mistake. <laughs> you need to think this over again. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, television is, is, is just such a, such a place for 
uh, for po it's like to me it feels like possibilities you know like it gives me hope again that if there's something really amazing to to create somebody somebody somewhere will put it on television or will make it for you and then help you sell it somewhere that will eventually be on television so it's changed a little bit since your days on seventh heaven <laughs> my days on seventh heaven you couldn't work in film if you were working in TV. It was a real hard line. It was a real distinction of, you know, you guys are here and you guys are here and don't try to, just don't try it. That's the way it felt. And then, I don't know, I don't remember when it changed, but it slowly got better. Why was USA the right home for this? Obviously, you know, it worked out really well. How did it end up at USA? Honestly, we pitched this thing everywhere and all the sort of regular places that you think would maybe go for this. I don't know. I guess we were thinking we would get some, we, would, we thought we would get some bites at HBO or Showtime or, you know, one of those places that, you know, wasn't really afraid to tackle this kind of intense material. And then we were out, you know, we were laying out some really intense stuff that's, that was coming down the pipeline, which who's out, whoever have seen the show, you know what I'm talking about. And I just didn't think that, you know, a, a network like this would would want to do that, but they were literally they were the f they almost bought it in the room. If I remember correctly, they were like, "We love this, we want this," and they were like, make, making deals behind us as we like walked out. It was this like <laughs> weird, kind of amazing experience. And honestly, I just think that they are they feel fearless to me. They feel like you know after Robot, they they want material that is explosive and um, and they want a new viewership and they're not that blue sky channel that they used to be. Isn't that the term? Blue sky channel, blue sky, or is it like blue sky blue? They don't wanna do that. And so, I mean, they're making a very strong turn here. No and blue skies here. <laughs> there's, there's dark clouds, <laughs> dark, rainy clouds. Welcome to the weather channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, I've been like really impressed with them every step of the way. And honestly, we would, uh, we would have notes calls about stuff we were shooting, you know, for our, for our pilot episodes or for, for some of our scripts that we were turning in and they would say, push it. Just push it as far as you can. They would say stuff like that to wow, us. We were like, amazing. huh? I mean, it was, I almost didn't believe them. <laughs> and you know, there were a few things that they kind of, they had to, kind of reined us in a little bit and say, we're not gonna show that, but we will show that. So it was an amazing partnership and it's continuing to be an amazing partnership. So I gotta ask, what did they pull you back on? What did the, didn't they wanna say? <laughs> um, it, well, it, this would be, this could be maybe a bit of a spoilerish alert. Okay, cover your ears. Spoiler cover your ears if you haven't it's, seen it's it. It's not really thematically spoiler or like really, just there's a, there's a scene where in the past, my character, when she's little and her father comes into, uh, they're sharing a room because mom has moved Phoebe into her, into the, the parents' master bedroom. And so he's stuck with his daughter and he's so sexually frustrated and he goes onto his bed and she's kind of tucked away in her bed and he, he masturbates in that scene, away from her, not, you know, we don't see anything of course, but you obviously get the idea of what's going on. And we thought it was really, I thought it was really important to sort of kind of put, lay the foundation for that relationship where you wrote, would think that that's going to take you down a path, you know, with these two characters. Um, and essentially you learned that that's not exactly what you think, um, but they weren't cool with that. It was, it was enough for him to be in his bed, taking his pants off and being in his boxer shorts with his six-year-old daughter kind of curled up on the other side of the room. And honestly, they were right. It, 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 it evoked the same emotion. It made people feel completely uncomfortable. And you immediately went, oh, well, her dad's gonna be, you know, some creep. Which is, you know, what we, what we wanted. Yeah, you definitely established that. <laughs> Very creepy. <laughs> How much of the material came straight from the book and what kind of changes did you make? We followed the book pretty closely in terms of like sort of plot and what happens at the end, what, what happens during that, you know, that big night sequence. 
I think where we really took some creative liberty was um, some of the exterior characters like uh, Bill's character, number one. Uh, Bill's character in the book is just not as thoroughly developed as the Cora character. She is just ripe with everything you could ever ask for, you know, in a, in a 360 de degree character. He was a little flat and just kind of like bouncing along on this investigation and you're not really knowing why. And at the end, you still don't even know why. So we kind of infused his character with, you know, some questionable past stuff that you will learn about that these two characters you know, they have that thing where you look at somebody and the, and they are looking at you and you just know that you've experienced something similar. So we kind of put that there. Then the Chris Abbott character who plays, well, Chris Abbott who plays my husband, the husband character, we kind of really made him a driving force for their relationship to try to get his family back and try to figure out what was going on and be a supporter of his wife as opposed to the book where he kind of sort of just dropped off into uh, the ether and he just didn't care and sort of just left his family. So it was more character, character stuff that we really changed but we kept the drive the way that the book you know, the, the path that the, book, that the book takes, we just, we continue down that path. So again, not giving anything away, but it has a finale, it has an ending. Would you consider a season two? Is there some universe in which you would return to this? Definitely could, would consider a season two. We never thought about that. You know, this was always sort of initially like this, um, just this limited thing, and that was just kind of it. But... The way we leave it, also without giving too much away, is that there's a lot more to discover with Bill's character. I don't know about my character. I mean, I would, I would. I just don't know if it makes any sense. And I, we have been talking about that because we we don't have a season two pickup, so we're still waiting oh, to. We hear. can take care of that. Great. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Who do I need to call? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be Bill McGoldrick from NBC. Uh, yeah, from USA. My phone. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I'm open to anything. I'm a, it's a little daunting. Like, I feel, I look at that photo, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> I, don't, I can't do it again. You want to go back there again? No. <laughs> this looks so cold and <laughs> miserable. Um, I, would, I would definitely love to produce this season two. And if, if I can, if, if Cora fits in and that makes the show better, whatever makes the show better, how do we beat season one? I don't know. It's scary to think what do we do? I mean, we, we just, we kind of had that lightning in a bottle thing, which sometimes you just have and sometimes you just don't. Most of the times you just don't. So it's a little scary to think about trying to create the same, the same feeling for season two, because I don't know if it's possible. Would you look for another book to develop instead? Always. We're currently <laughs> neck deep in books, <laughs> looking for source material. Um, because yeah, now we don't, we're like, We've got nothing to go off, so now we have to use our imaginations. Boring. <laughs> Thank God we have amazing writer. He, they figure it out. <laughs> did you always want to be an actor? When did you know you wanted to act? I think, I think it's just always been part of what I did. I was just a kid, like, always going to music classes and um, always doing regional theater and putting on plays and shows with my little brother at home and... That's just what I did. I, I honestly don't remember a time that it wasn't part of my life, but I also don't remember the time where I said, oh, this is what I want to do with my life. I don't really remember, but it was way back there. Like under 10, I was, you know, it just was what I was always doing. Was there one piece of advice you got that really helped you as an actor? Oh man, put me on the spot with the good ones. Um, well, I think I think the amount of rejection that we always are constantly having to deal with is pretty intense. And I, I one piece of advice that I did get was, you know, you know, if you don't get something, what's their is their loss? Like you really have to look at it that way because especially now having some experience on the other side of the casting process, literally p people will go, 
her hair is kind of like really too brown. You're like, oh, okay, okay. We can dye it. You, you know, it's like literally you're dealing with people that don't have imagination sometimes. And you can't believe that that's, the, those are the people that are casting you. <laughs> it's not your fault, you know? And to be able to just brush it off and go, okay, great, great, your, your loss, on to the next. You, your loss and really be able to feel that and genuinely know that, you know, it's not you. All right, so I want to get to some of your questions. This one is from Carmen. She wants to know, which character do you feel the most sympathy for? In the show. That's a really good question because I think, I mean, what we tried to do is create a whole cast of people that you maybe initially don't feel sympathy for and then really start to have this great empathy for, well, maybe sympathy because maybe you don't understand exactly how they feel, but I mean, I would probably have to say, I would probably have to say Cora, maybe just because I feel the most about her and for her, and she t she takes so much abuse um, from so many levels, from so many people, people that knew her, people that didn't really know her, and um, Maybe that's why I, maybe that's why this whole thing for me was quite a, quite a moving emotional experience, because I, I just, I just felt so bad for her. I mean, I still do. I'm still, like I said, looking over that, feeling horrible for that person. Like, I don't feel like that's me. I just feel like that's somebody else. Poor thing. <laughs> Someone get her a towel. <laughs> All right, this one is from Rachel. Um, what was your hook to get into the skin of this woman? Were there any choices or flavors of a choice you brought that stayed that the director had to keep? Sorry, repeat that. Sorry. Flavors? Flavors. Does that say flavors or flavors of a choice? So let's just say, like, the, That's a nice way to put it. I know, I like that too. Well done, Rachel. Were there any flavors? <laughs> I'm going to steal that question. Um, so were there any flavors of a choice you brought in that stayed that the director had to keep because you brought it to the character? I brought it to the character. Um, that's a really good question. There was a um, kind of a jitteriness to her at times that maybe you didn't even see because we were in a close up or something. That I, I, she, I was my my knee bounced a lot, kind of naturally, like really kind of neurotically. That helped me somehow, kind of create this anxiety and and build the tension that was constantly within this person's body maybe that's kind of a flavor that that I brought to the table more of a physical thing um, and also when Cora sleeps well we did this a couple times but but I had this idea that she sleeps with her fist like fists squeezed I have a friend who actually does this because she has so much t stress in her life and literally she sleeps like squeezing her fist and wakes up like uh, like this kind of thing and I just thought it was such an incredible physical manifestation of tension and fear and just out of control so anytime Cora sleeps she's like with this clenched fist so maybe more like these physical attributes that I was pl playing around with that the director seemed to be into. So what's next for you other than diving through piles of books looking for your next project? What's next on your agenda? For work? I don't know, I'm out of work. <laughs> I'm looking. <laughs> um, I don't know, something intriguing, something cool, something, something special, something that you know you feel, something that I feel that I can leave my family and and take the time to, to be away and work. I don't know what that is. I, I'm, I would love to do something like, I don't know, like be on Curb Your Enthusiasm. I don't know, I think I'm funny enough for that, but I, I don't know, like something weird like that. That would be really fun for me to do something very different, something funny or just quirky and weird. I, I don't know, I'm, I, don't have, I don't have a real path yet. So we've What's got good? a long, list of people to call Bill McGoldrick and Larry David and we'll yeah. take care of it <laughs> no, don't call him I'm already getting nervous thinking about Larry David hearing anything about this conversation <laughs>
<laughs> well, unfortunately, we've got to end it there. Thanks so much for you guys for coming, and thanks so much, Jessica. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it.